Uh, thanks, Bill. It's great to be here. Um, it, it's actually almost exactly 40 years uh, to, the, to the day when the, the internet was invented. This, uh, uh, in October 1969, Len Kleinrock at UCLA sent the first uh, message over what was about to become the, the ARPANET. Uh, to SRI in in, uh, in Palo Alto, and I think the the the, uh, the first message was log in, right? So there, so he didn't. I mean, he maybe wasn't sort of like fully cognizant of history at that moment in time. He should have talked to Neil Armstrong to to have a better <laughs> thing to say. Um, but anyway, 40 years later, uh, I want to talk uh, uh, not so much about um, you know all the interesting things that the the, the web has created in the world in terms of you know, new business models, new ways of interacting, new kinds of social norms, and, and lots of other questions that might be of interest to, to social scientists, but actually using the web to do social science as a, as a tool. Uh, and so I'll just sort of start with some platitudes about you know, what makes social science social. Like why is this sort of an interesting and, and hard field to study? And uh, you know, there are probably... Uh, more definitions of what sociology is than there are sociologists, but uh, but this is mine uh, that 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 we call a phenomenon a social phenomenon when it arises out of the interactions of many individuals and they collectively produce something that is more than just a, a group of individuals. So this is something that sociologists call a micro macro problem and something that is called emergence in other fields and sort of a you know a deep scientific. Uh, problem you know, everywhere in science, but uh, is sort of, in a sense, all of social science. Right? And that's one reason why social science is so, is so difficult, that the things that we're interested in, families, firms, markets, associations, cultures, all sort of somehow come out of, of individual people doing their own thing and interacting with each other. But they are also more than just individual people. They have their own rules, uh, they have their own persistence, uh, and they can be studied at their own level. Uh, and so. Historically, what we would like to be able to do as social scientists is try to understand this aggregation process. How do we get from the micro to the macro, and what is it about the interactions that's so important? But historically, this is not typically what social scientists have done. That We have tended to study either the micro-level processes, uh, or we study the macro-level institutions or groups. Um, and I, I would, I'm just going to claim this. I think it's true. Uh, we can sort of argue about this in question time if you want, uh, that as a result, we've missed a lot of the really sort of interesting and deep questions of social science. And we've, over the last year, we've had a, a sort of debate about uh, 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 systemic risk in financial systems. I mean, a, a, you know, a year and a half ago, I don't think anybody even used the term systemic risk. And now it's sort of like everybody knows what systemic risk is. Um, uh, but actually, nobody really knows what systemic risk is. There are no adequate definitions. There's no sort of uh, real theory about uh, how you get a bunch of financial institutions together, and they sort of interact, and they, they, uh, uh, they trade with each other. Uh, people have beliefs about models and so on. Uh, and out of all of this, we get a system where uh, one institution can, can fail and, and somehow generate a, a much greater risk uh, for the system as a whole. Um, so that's true in finance, but then there are equivalent problems in every other part of social science as well. Um, and so, again, I'm just going to claim this, that there are, there are, of course, many reasons why these are difficult problems to, uh, to, uh, to try to figure out. But two very important ones that we're going to talk about today uh, is that you know, when, if you believe, as sociologists since you know, Weber's time have believed, that the interactions matter, right? that it matters how people uh, interact with each other and what the consequences of those interactions are and possibly even the structure of those interactions, uh, you have a problem because these interactions are extremely hard to observe or, or measure, uh, especially when you're talking about sort of micro-level entities, people. Um, uh, you have to measure things at the micro-level, but you have to do it for huge numbers of people uh, at the same time over some extended period of time. So this is sort of a, just a data problem uh, is enormous. Uh, the other big problem uh, is that you can't do experiments, right? Well, it's very difficult to do experiments. Uh, uh, so it's very hard to do, I mean, if you ask yourself, well, what is science? You know, when you go back to high school and learn the scientific method, it's sort of measuring things and doing experiments. So you can't measure anything and you can't do experiments, you're in trouble. Um, and so the interesting thing that's happened over this last uh, uh, 10 years or so uh, 
uh, is that the, this sort of technological revolution that we associate with the internet but is really uh, a bit broader than that, you know, it involves you know, electronic communication technologies of, of all kinds, um, it involves critically the web, uh, is generating the kind of data that we could only have sort of dreamt about uh, a decade ago. Uh, and, uh, you know, working at Yahoo, it's sort of a little bit overwhelming uh, how much this data is. It piles up very quickly. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, on average, you know, roughly speaking, about sort of uh, 500 uh, uh, terabytes of audience data. This is just people clicking on websites and, and doing other sorts of things. Um, per year, and if you look at the email archives of Yahoo Mail, which is one of the bigger uh, mail providers in the world, does anyone know what a, what a PB is? <laughs> yes, a petabyte, right? So we, we, we're not used to talking about petabytes in social science. Um, uh, so uh, it's a you know, thousand terabytes, which is a million gigabytes. Uh, so this is actually, so petabytes is starting to be a, a lot of data, right? Um, it actually starts to get expensive. Um, so. Uh, I just want to say that this is, a, you know, a lot of what we actually do at Yahoo Research is involved with what we might call observational data, which comes from all these different sources, and this is tremendously interesting, and there's, you know, thousands of papers now being published uh, using this kind of data. Um, and I don't, I really want to talk about that today, because I want to talk about a related, you know, the sort of second of these two bullet points at the top, which is, well, how can we use the web to actually do experiments? And so, Experiments are, you know, have advantages and disadvantages over observational data. Uh, uh, you know, the main advantage is that, uh, is that you, in an experimental environment, particularly in a lab setting, you get to sort of grossly simplify the world and study, you know, just the one particular thing that you're interested in uh, and you can vary, you know, you can have controls and you can systematically vary the environment and so you can, um, uh, you can, uh, do a much better job of isolating cause and effect uh, than you can uh, in observational data. And field experiments is somewhat in between. Um, uh, and there's a long history of doing these sorts of experiments, particularly in, psych in psychology and, and, and also in, uh, more recently in, in behavioral economics. But of course, there are lots of disadvantages as well for understanding you know, complex social phenomena, which is that maybe you, in the process of simplifying things, you threw out everything that's interesting or you have great difficulty generalizing from the lab to the real world. Uh, it also gets particularly problematic when you're talking about sociology because almost everything we're interested in uh, involves large numbers of people and as we'll see, it's, it's sort of you know, too many undergraduates to, to put into a lab. Uh, so, uh, and this was a, you know, a, a question that came up decades ago, the sociologist Morris Zeldich sort of posed this question can you study an army in a laboratory? And the answer at the time was no, you can't. There aren't big enough labs. Um, and the army probably has other things to be doing. Um, but uh, so out of that sort of observation grew this, this, the alternative approach, which was more sort of study small groups in a lab and then try to generalize from small groups to, to large groups. But there's, of course, a problem with that, which is large groups are, are just different. Uh, and so we don't really have a field. You know, we have macro economics, but we don't really have a, a field of, of uh, well, I guess you could say we have macro sociology, but we certainly don't have experimental macro sociology. We certainly have some experimental sociology, but it tends to be done with, with uh, groups of, of less than about 10. Uh, my, my colleague Michael Kearns at, at the, uh, uh, the University of Pennsylvania, who will come up again at the end of the talk, um, has done this sort of very interesting series of experiments on, on what he calls networked games where you have groups of 36 people in a network with some topology uh, playing maybe a graph coloring game or a, uh, a, an economic exchange game or some kind of uh, dominance game. Uh, and the reason why it's 36 is that's the biggest classroom that they have, right? And so again, you sort of hit this physical constraint. It would be interesting to see what happened when it's 360, but unfortunately that's just not possible. So, the question I want to, you know, ask in general is like, well, what happens when we start moving experiments onto the web and what kinds of challenges do we run into and what kinds of problems, you know, which things become easier, which things become more difficult and what's the potential for doing this? This is sort of the, the backdrop question. But I'm going to uh, approach it in a somewhat autobiographical way, just going back to 2001 uh, when we did our first 
uh, web-based experiment, uh, and then just go through a series of experiments uh, uh, since then, coming right up until the present, which is, you know, one of my postdocs, Sid Suri, is back in New York, chained to his desk, um, currently running experiments that I, I'm hoping will work out better than the last lot. Um, so well, I'll find out next week. So this is sort of very, very current. Uh, and each of these experiments, you know, we were interested in for other reasons, right? There was some sort of theoretical question that we were interested in, and we designed an experiment to try to understand it better. Um, but along the way, we're sort of building up this kind of uh, experience of doing things online and, and thinking of, of, uh, of new ideas that are, are you know, methodological as well. Okay, so the first experiment uh, goes back to a very old experiment done in the 1960s. I'm sure many of you have heard of this, but I'll just run through it briefly. So this is sort of the famous small world experiment of, of Milgram and Travers that, that you know, was one of the motivating uh, puzzles that, that got me sort of interested in network theory and, and social science to begin with uh, back in, in graduate school. Um, and uh, the experimental design was the following. Milgram picked a, a single person who was an acquaintance of his, a stockbroker in Boston and named him the target of this experiment. And then he gave 300 uh, physical packets uh, to uh, other individuals, uh, more or less randomly selected from uh, a third of them from Boston and the other two thirds from Omaha, Nebraska, which I guess Milgram figured was the most distant place in America from, from Boston, which is pretty accurate. And, um, uh, and each one of these senders was given a lot of information about the target person, you know, even his, his full address, so they could easily have sent it to him, but the catch was you could only send it to him if you knew the guy on a first name basis, so that's the rule. Uh, the chances are that you don't, uh, in fact nobody did, so you had to send it to someone you did know on a first name basis who you thought was closer to the target than you were, at which point everything repeats. Uh, so this generates a series of letter chains, uh, started out with 300, 64 of them actually somewhat remarkably, it's amazing actually that as many reached the target as did, and the typical length of these chains was, was about six. And so presumably this is where the, the phrase six degrees of separation uh, came from, although Milgram himself never actually coined that phrase. Um, so many years later, uh, having done some theoretical work trying to understand this problem, uh, we decided to actually rerun the experiment, uh, only at this point we thought we could uh, do it on a larger scale if we were to use the web instead of physical uh, packets. Uh, it was also much cheaper to do it that way. So by comparison with Milgram's design, we picked uh, 18 different targets in, in, I think, 13 different countries around the world, five in the US and, uh, um, uh, and then 13 other countries. Um, and we tried to make these sort of as diverse as, as we could in terms of you know, background and occupation and so on. Um, and whereas Milgram had 300 letter chains trying to reach his target, we had about almost 25,000 chains uh, starting out. And uh, cumulatively, they passed through over 60,000 people in 166 country, uh, countries around the world. So I think there's a 192 countries or something in the UN. So this is starting to get to the scale of, of the whole world. And there's all sorts of problems with this experiment, and we can talk about that. One, one of them is that only 400 of these chains actually uh, reach the target. Fortunately, there's uh, some nice tricks that you can play to try to estimate how long the chains would have been uh, if they had continued. Um, oh, so here's a, a nice little picture that one of my students generated. So this is uh, a chain that was directed, or this is, so this is one of our targets, which actually is my old graduate school advisor, Steve Strogatz, who lives in Ithaca, New York. Uh, and so that, the center of that dot is actually in upstate New York. And this is the, so, so several thousand of these chains uh, were started all around the world, and uh, there's a dot for every initial starting point. Uh, and they're all trying to reach Strogatz. And so each one of these frames, as we step down, shows this is the first degree, the second degree, the third degree, and so on. And you can see that everything has gotten to him, or everything that's going to get to him has got to him uh, in eight steps. Uh, and it's sort of interesting to see how these chains uh, progress where they, for example, coalesce into major cities. So uh, it's actually, you know, and this, this sort of really confirms Milgram's intuition that, you know, LA, oh, actually, I think that's San Francisco, uh, is closer to New York than Omaha is, right? 
uh, because uh, in terms of social networks. So, so this is sort of an interesting visualization, but of course you can actually compute the lengths of all these chains. And it, remarkably, it's very close. Uh, I think actually the, the, the final result is um, that the, the median chain length is about uh, seven. Uh, and this is sort of robust to all sorts of different assumptions. Um, so this is pretty good um, in terms of confirming Milgram's findings. Um, but I think what really struck us in the process of running this experiment was that we had just sort of created this fairly amateurish website. Uh, and uh, uh, mostly because some nice lady who also happened to be a reporter at the New York Times wrote a story about this experiment. We went from having a few hundred people to several tens of thousands of people participating in this experiment almost overnight. Um, and uh, this happened with almost no cost. Right? So we thought uh, we had this sort of realization that there's you know, thousands of people around the world who are sitting at their desks uh, and they're bored. Uh, and this is what the, my friend Jonah Peretti calls the board at work network. Um, and maybe there's millions of these people around the world, and there's this vast, untapped labor pool. Uh, uh, and if you can just sort of give them something interesting to do for a few minutes, they will do social science for you for free. Uh, and so what can we do next? Uh, and so we, we, you know, everything that follows is sort of an answer to that question. Uh, now, obviously, this was not like anything like a lab experiment. Right? It's not even really a field experiment. There's no controls here. Right? We're just sort of you know, trying things out. Uh, we can look at variations, but we, we can't actually sort of, we don't have an experimental instrument here. So we wanted to design something that was more like a lab experiment, um, but on a larger scale. Uh, so this is a completely different uh, motivational problem. But another thing that we've been interested in for, for many years is, uh, is uh, the relationship between social influence, a micro-level process, and the structure of cultural markets, which is a, you know, a macro-level outcome. And if you look at cultural markets, things, markets for things like books and music and, and movies, uh, they all have a couple of very sort of striking stylized features. One is that successful things, you know, hit songs and blockbuster movies and best-selling books, are not just more successful than average, but orders of magnitude more successful than average. Uh, so, you know, the Harry Potter books have sold about 350 million <laughs> copies around the world. The Titanic grossed about $600 million at the US box office. Michael Jackson's Thriller album sold 50 million copies. I mean, these are not just different from the mean. They're you know, sort of several orders of magnitude different from the mean. Uh, and you might think that they're, they're, the reason why they're so successful is because they're you know, sort of orders of magnitude better than anything else that's out there, and that this uh, success is just uh, 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 simply uh, a process of learning what it was that people wanted all along. Um, unfortunately, that well, it, that may be true, but if it's if it's true, it, it doesn't sort of lend itself to any ex ante predictability. So most of these uh, hits uh, turn out to be, and Harry Potter is a great example of this. Turn out to be very very difficult for even sort of you know well motivated experts to be able to uh, predict in advance. And so it's this combination of inequality and unpredictability in cultural markets that we were trying to. Um, Understand, and the hypothesis is that somehow this has something to do with the uh, these, these sort of micro-level social influence processes. So, the the kind of lab experiment that you'd like to be able to run is one where you, uh, instead of just looking at the the one world that we actually have, the observational data, uh, you would like to be able to, in a sense, rewind history and run it many times, and ask whether the same thing, you know, the same thing that wins in this world, wins in all these other worlds as well. And if that's true, if there's some sort of deterministic process, then you might think, well, there's something about, you know, intrinsically about the, the, the successful objects that makes them successful. And if instead you observe that there's, uh, you know, sort of a lot of uh, uh, heterog heterogeneity across different versions of, the, of, of history, uh, you might conclude that it's just some sort of stochastic process, right? And so the object is to, to test this in a lab, uh, something you can't do in, in real life. But even in the lab, you have to have you know, hundreds of people for each individual history. right? So every time you want to run a market, you have to have hundreds of people interacting with each other. Um, and then you want to have many versions of this market, so that's thousands of people. And you want to have different experimental conditions, so that's now tens of thousands of people. And, and this is where we get the problem with the lab. So uh, the solution is to try to build this experiment on the web. Uh, and this is 
uh, work with Matt Selganik, who is now a, a sociology professor at Princeton, and Peter Dodds, who is a, a math professor at Vermont. Um, and together we put together this experiment called Music Lab. So participants come to this website and they, uh, they see a collection of 48 songs by bands that I guarantee you've never heard of. And uh, in some conditions, uh, so each, each one of these little grid squares is, a, is, a, is the band at the top and then the, the name of the song. Uh, and then uh, this little number here is the number of times that this song has been downloaded by previous participants. So you click on one of these little squares and the song streams for you over your, over your, uh, your browser. And you can listen to it for as long as you want, give it a rating from one to five stars. We ask you if you'd like to download it. You can say yes or no. Uh, and then we just put you through, well, we send you back to that screen and you can, you can um, listen to as many songs as you want. So what you don't know when this is happening is that you're being put in one of two experimental conditions. So the one you just saw is what we call the social information condition where you see the downloads. Uh, the independent condition, uh, it looks exactly the same except there's no numbers, right? Uh, so this creates one world in which people have to make decisions independently of each other. Within the social information condition, we further split people into one of eight different worlds. Uh, and the numbers that you see are the downloads of people ahead of you in that world, but not anything about the other worlds. So we create nine different copies of the universe. Uh, and we start everything identically with zero downloads, and we, then we just let everything run forward in time. So that's the basic design. Um, and I'm not going to go into the, the details, because I'm uh, just sort of skipping over different things. But uh, we had this, this was the, the first experiment that I just showed you at about 7,000 people. And in the second experiment, we, we increased the strength of the social signal by ranking everything from most popular to least popular. So it becomes much more obvious which is the most popular song. Uh, both these experiments were done with uh, mostly teenagers that we recruited off a, a, a social networking site called Bolt.com. Uh, we then redid the, the second uh, experiment uh, with a different group of people that we recruited from uh, whose emails we had from the previous experiment, the small world experiment. These were much older, uh, more professional people. And then finally we tried an experiment where we actually inverted the rankings of the songs to see if we could uh, deceive people into... Uh, keeping a song popular just because they thought it was popular, a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. Anyway, so uh, I won't go into the details, but uh, the, the sort of general summary is that people, in fact, are influenced by what they see. So you can, you can tell that very clearly. Um, and uh, the stronger the social signal, the more salient you make it, the more influence it has over them. Uh, that's probably not that surprising. What's less intuitive uh, is that when this is true, when people know what other people like, Popular songs become more popular, unpopular songs become less popular, so we see a big increase in the inequality of the distribution of success. And at the same time, we see an increase in the unpredictability uh, in terms of you know, which particular song is going to become uh, the most popular. So there's a bit of a paradox here, which is that you're actually, by giving people more information, you're, just, you're, you're helping them. You're, you're, you're helping them solve their individual problem about what they want to listen to, what they should listen to. Um, but the result is that the, the market generates less information. Right? So this is uh, sort of similar to um, this theory of information cascades in, in economics. Uh, manipulating this, once you realize that this phenomenon exists, you might, the next thing you think of is, well, can we manipulate it? And that actually turns out to be sort of possible, but, but trickier than you, you might think. Uh, and the, you can sort of fool some of the people some of the time, but you, you can't fool all the people all of the time. Uh, so, much more recently, this is work that's now uh, done it uh, since I joined Yahoo, um, uh, but was inspired by a, a dissertation that um, Delia Baldessari, who was another graduate student at, at Columbia, who's now also at Princeton, uh, wrote about uh, political polarization. And she made this sort of interesting observation, uh, uh, which is that. Uh, you know, political scientists uh, really, and political sociologists really uh, disagree about how much uh, polarization there is in the world. So, so there's uh, you know, some sort of alarm, particularly in the US these days, that, that the world is becoming much more uh, um, uh, disconnected or, or balkanized 
into sort of small communities of like-minded individuals and everyone just talks to people who are just like them and they reinforce each other's beliefs and the people in different groups don't talk to each other and this is sort of bad for, for, uh, um, uh, for society. Uh, but other studies seem to find uh, sort of contradictory results where you know, people seem to disagree quite a bit actually. Um, uh, people's own opinions are not terribly consistent that if you, it's very hard to predict people's particular views on particular issues, just knowing that they're a Republican or a Democrat, for example. Uh, and so uh, Delia was, was speculating that, that the, the difference between these two sets of results is that there's a difference between uh, how similar people really are and how similar they think they are. That there's a sort of, that people perceive themselves to be more similar um, than in fact they are with respect to their friends. So this is a, you know, a, a very sort of simple conjecture to test uh, in theory, but in practice it's kind of difficult because you have to collect a lot of data. So for just a single question, you have to know what A thinks about Q, and you have to know what A's friend B thinks about Q, and you have to know what A thinks B thinks about Q. And so if you have lots of friends and lots of questions, this quickly becomes a very, very long survey, right? Um, and very expensive to conduct in the standard sort of interview uh, manner. Uh, and so people don't really do surveys like this. Um, but Right around this time, when we were thinking about this, Facebook uh, released its uh, developer platform for third-party developers. Uh, and so we thought, this is, you know, this is a, you know, perfect, because Facebook has this sort of built-in network structure. Um, and we can build an app that basically asks people exactly what we saw on the last slide. What do you think about this question? What do you think your friend thinks about this question? Then we ask the friend. Um, so this is the app we built. And this is Sharad Goyle. Uh, one of my group members, uh, and this is my view of the app. So down the bottom here, you can see uh, uh, my some of my friends on Facebook, uh, and it, it's it's got this question here, which is which is adapted from the general social survey. So these are all sort of questions that that that, that people ask Americans all the time about politics. So the question is: Does does Sherrod Goyle approve of laws that deny U.S. drivers' license? Uh, U.S. driver's licenses to illegal immigrants. So Charles a pretty liberal leaning guy, so I'm going to guess that he does not approve of these laws. And so I'll click on no. Uh, and if, if Francence knows the answer, then uh, it will tell me whether I'm right or wrong. And if it, if it doesn't, it, it will ask me if I want to ask him. Uh, so it has a, a sort of viral component built into it. And then I can just do this for as many friends and questions as I want until I get sick of it. Uh, and some people actually answered hundreds of these questions. Um, it was a little bit addictive. Um, and uh, this little bar at the top tells me what my, what my, what my score is so far, my friend sense is, um, about 76%, which is actually not that good. Um, so uh, OK. So this is the way we collect data. And we had about 1,500 respondents, which is a sort of drop in the ocean by Facebook standards, but it's pretty good for surveys. Uh, and about 17,000 uh, of, these, of these complete dyads that I described before, and then a, a, a whole bunch of partial data. So this is something that, that you know, in the old days would have taken years and cost a couple of hundred thousand dollars to, to implement. Um, this uh, only takes years to publish. Um, um, because non-standard methodology, yes, you don't want to do that. Um, OK, um, so uh, that's a different lecture. Uh, this was very cheap and very quick to do, right? Only took us a couple of months. And, uh, and the results are, you know, uh, mostly reassuring uh, that here is uh, uh, plotted uh, um, on the, the x-axis here is what we call baseline homophily, which is just the, the probability that two randomly chosen people from our, our pool of respondents will agree on a particular question, right? So each circle is a question, about 80 different questions. Uh, and the y-axis is the probability that two people who are friends will agree on the same question. And so you can see that just about everything is above the diagonal. Right? So clearly, uh, friends agree more than strangers, which is completely consistent with all the other results in homophily that have been collected over the years. Uh, it's also true, however, that if you uh, measure perceived homophily versus actual homophily, that people also think that they're more similar to their friends than they really are. And in some cases, these differences are sort of comparable. Um, so that's the basic result. Friends are more similar than strangers, but everybody thinks they're more similar than they really are. And where this is sort of become striking is that people are extremely bad at knowing when their friends disagree with them. Uh, 
And this is true, uh, so worse than random guessing. Right? So on average, it's about 41% of the time they guess correctly that the other person disagrees with them. Um, if they talk about politics, they do a little bit better. Um, they get about six percentage points. Actually, I think it's, yes, maybe it's actually worse. Uh, maybe it's more like 39%. I think it's about 45% when you, when you actually talk about politics. So it, it sort of raises this question about, well, when people talk about politics, what are they talking about? Because they're not talking about the issues, right? And this, uh, the, the sort of numbers are, are, are backed up by our own kind of anecdotal experience playing the game and, and reports that we got from other people playing the game, which is that it's, it's surprising how often you get asked a question about someone and you sort of think you know this person pretty well. Maybe you're married to them, for example. And, um, and so you, you think that you should know the answer to this question. And, but as it turns out, you don't. You sort of, either you, either you think that you don't, in which case that's disturbing, or you think that you do and you get the answer wrong. And then there's a fight, right? That people are like, I can't believe that you thought that I thought that. Um, so there's a sort of tremendous amount of, of misunderstanding about other people's beliefs, even between people who are good friends who talk about politics. And so, so this does in fact seem to support uh, Dahlia's hypothesis uh, and, and raises other sort of related issues about, about social influence that you know, we just sort of, in these models that we write down about social influence, there's just sort of a, an unstated assumption that you actually know what the other person thinks and that that is able to influence your own perspectives. Um, but if in fact all you're really seeing is your own opinion reflected in them, then it's not clear who's actually influencing whom. So the, uh, the next experiment that I want to talk about also done last year with, uh, with Winter Mason, who's another one of my group members. He's a social psychologist. Uh, and we were uh, working on a study to do with uh, all sorts of interesting uh, uh, things to do with peer production and, and crowdsourcing and, and, uh, and other sort of, of the, uh, things going on online. Um, and one of the questions that came up in this study is, you know, how do people respond to incentives? And you know, there's, that's a, a big question that has uh, lots of dimensions. But if we just sort of narrow it down to financial incentives, uh, this is still a pretty big question that people have thought about in economics and in psychology and management science for, for decades. Um, and it, there's sort of this general dichotomy between, uh, between you know, fixed wages and performance-based pay. And performance-based pay is almost sort of like a dirty word these days. Um, uh, that it's a good, really, uh, you, uh, it's sort of obvious, I guess, now that, that performance-based pay is a little more complicated than we might have thought. Um, and so we just sort of want to narrowly focus on a part of this question, um, which is uh, if you basically take two workers and you give them the same job to do and you pay one of them more, do they do a better job? Right? And you might think, well, yes, the answer is obvious. But, um, but actually, the answer is not obvious. Um, and the way that we tried to test this is by using an actual crowdsourcing website, this, this wonderful site that I encourage you to, well, actually checking it out is kind of boring. But uh, the idea of it is really interesting. Uh, and it's called um, Amazon's Mechanical Turk. And I don't know if you know what the, the original Mechanical Turk was, but it was a, a chess playing automaton uh, that was around in the, the early uh, uh, 19th century that was famous for having beaten Napoleon at chess. Right? So of course it turns out it's not really an automaton, it's a fraud. There's a person inside uh, who's actually pretending to be an automaton. And uh, so this is where the phrase artificial, artificial intelligence came from that, that Jeff Bezos uses to describe Amazon's Mechanical Turk. So this is a great site where you can, you know, if, you've got a, if, you, if you have all your, your photo albums online, you have thousands and thousands of images and you would like somebody to go through and label all these images with, you know, beach, person, beach ball, uh, so that you could maybe search them all very easily rather than having sort of these horrible descriptors that your camera provides for them. Um, this is an absolutely onerous task that you would never do, right, because it would take you thousands of hours. You can throw it up on Amazon Mechanical Turk and you can pay people one cent per image and they'll do it for you overnight, right? So. Uh, and if you don't believe me, just try it. They really will. Um, and they actually do a pretty good job. So, um, uh, so, we, uh, so there's lots of people doing those kinds of jobs on Mechanical Turk. Um, uh, we sort of use it as the electronic uh, web version of, um, 
uh, putting up posters around campus and saying, if you would like to participate in this interesting experiment, come to the psychology lab at you know, 2 o'clock on a Thursday. Uh, we have them visit our, our sandbox server, which you see on the right-hand side there, at Yahoo Research. And so we use it as a recruiting pipeline and also as a way to pay subject, which is, is actually very handy because otherwise it could be, uh, that, that could be messy. Um, so the experiment that I'm going to talk about right now uh, has a very simple design. Uh, people accept this hit, the human intelligence task. Uh, we pay them an upfront fee, fee, they arrive at Sandbox, we explain the, the, um, the task to them. What they don't know, once again, is that they're getting randomly shunted into one of uh, nine different experimental conditions. Uh, there's three levels of pay and there's three levels of difficulty. Uh, so this is the task. Uh, it's a fairly straightforward task. These are all images taken from another great website called trafficland.com, which has streaming uh, 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 tr traffic videos uh, taken from all around the world. So if, you, if, it, if it happens to have a, a, a one in your hometown, you can actually sit there online and look at traffic driving along the street in your hometown from the other side of the world. Um, and, um, but you shouldn't do that, because that would be a waste of time. Uh, uh, th so this is actually from, from Winter's hometown, Maryland, USA, uh, uh, and um, uh, these snapshots are taken two seconds apart, so you can actually see the temporal ordering of them. But then we reshuffle them into the wrong order, and then we give them to the Turkers who have to put them back in the correct order. So the easy version is two photos, the medium version is three, and the difficult one is four. Um, and some of them are actually quite difficult. Uh, and uh, there's 99 sets of each, so you can, you can label, you can, you, can, you can solve anywhere from zero, you can just look at this and say, oh, I'm not interested, no thanks, it's not worth it, or you can do all 99 of them. So there's a lot of sort of potential variation there. Uh, we had about 600 participants from, uh, it's interesting actually just to even see who is on Mechanical Turk and what they're doing. These are sort of surprisingly typical figures, you get ages all over the place, you get incomes all over the place, and you might say well, people are just making these up, uh, it's all self-reported, which is true, but uh, it's interesting that you get similar distributions, you know, all the time for different experiments. So um, maybe they're not making it up. Um, okay, so here are the results. Um, and again, you can do anywhere between 0 and 99 uh, of these tasks. And so on the left-hand side, we have, well, we have two things that we're interested in. One is how much work do people do, and the other is how good are they at doing it. The left-hand side is the quantity result. So this is the number of image sets that people sorted. And this, is, this line is for four images, this is for three, and this is for two. So you can see that the easier the task is, the more likely they are to keep doing it for any given payment level. And the more you pay them, the more they do. Right? So this is very sort of rational choicey, exactly what you'd expect. Um, on the right-hand side, you see the accuracy. Right? So this is the, just the raw uh, percentage of uh, of uh, tasks that they got into the correct order. Now, of course, uh, so again, two does better than three, which does better than four, because just, you know, if you just do things randomly, then you're going to be right half the time if you have two. If you actually factor out the baseline, then there's no uh, effect of difficulty on accuracy, that people do just about the same. Um, now, the other interesting point is that there's absolutely no effect of pay level either. And so that was very surprising to us, um, but, and we weren't quite sure, you know, one can speculate about why this is true, um, but almost by accident we discovered the following, which is that after the experiment we asked them some questions about their experience, and one of the questions we asked them was how much do you think you should have been paid to do what you just did? And this is really the important thing to look at, that on the, in the inset here, you see a plot of how much they thought they should have gotten paid versus how much they actually got paid. And so people who got paid one cent per image set thought they should have gotten paid five cents. People who got paid five cents thought they should have gotten paid eight cents. And people who got paid 10 cents thought they should have gotten paid 13 cents. So it doesn't matter what you pay people, they always think they're underpaid. <laughs> um, and this is a very, I mean, this is almost a linear relationship. It's about as close to linear as you could possibly hope for. Um, so there's a very sort of striking anchoring result here. So anchoring is something that's been observed in lots of other contexts in, in uh, social psychology. Um, but it seems to apply to compensation as well. 
that the, the more you get paid, the more you think you should get paid. This possibly undermines the, the extra kind of incentive that you might think you'd give people. I should know that people are only getting paid when they do things correctly, right? So they're not, they're not this, is, this is pay for performance, right? So you might think, well, if, I, if, you know, if each image set is worth 10 cents to me instead of one cent, I'm going to spend a little more time trying to get it right. But that actually is not what people do. Okay. So increased pay less it's more work, but not more accurate work. Uh, uh, we think this is a, an anchoring effect. Uh, and what we learned out of this is you just pay people the least amount of money you can pay them. Um, <laughs> um, because they don't do a better job. Um, and uh, we've actually seen this uh, analogous results in, in the, the experiments that I'm about to talk about next. Um, I think I'm going to squeeze this, this in just in time. So, uh, so the final experiment I want to talk about is, is a, in, a, a very different question again, which is this sort of you know, very, very old question that goes back to Hobbes uh, in social science. Maybe it's like the original question of social science, which is why do people cooperate? People are selfish, they're self-interested, and yet we observe all sorts of cooperation uh, uh, around us in the world. And, um, and you know, how do we understand this? And um, uh, actually, this year's Nobel Prize was just awarded for the first time to a non-economist, I think, uh, Eleanor Ostrom, who is a political scientist uh, who has studied uh, uh, public goods <coughs> games in the public goods uh, problems in the, in the field for many years now. Um, so a pub, what is a public goods game? Uh, the, the sort of very uh, uh, brief version of the model is that we have a series of rounds that we play for. And each round, every player gets some sort of endowment. Let's just say points. So everybody gets 10 points. And each round, you have to decide uh, how much of your 10 points you're going to put into a common pool. Um, you can put zero in, you can put 10 in, or any number in between. Uh, the, the pool is then gathered together and multiplied by some factor, which in this case is going to be 1.4, but it could be any uh, constant that you like. And then the, it is redistributed critically equally to all people in the group, right? not just the people who, who contributed. And so what this sets up is a dilemma, where everybody does very well if everybody puts in the maximum amount. But individually, you do better if everybody else puts in the maximum amount and you put in nothing. Uh, and so, but of course, if everybody puts in nothing, then everyone does badly. So this is the dilemma. Uh, and the question is, you know, can people solve it? And if so, how? And what mechanisms can we introduce to make people contribute more? And there have been you know, thousands of experiments done. Uh, and uh, one of the leaders in this is, is Ernst Fair in Zurich. Um, and uh, he has done a number of experiments where you take groups of four people in a lab, uh, a real lab, and uh, you have them uh, play this game uh, under various different conditions. And, and so um, we'll actually see those results in a second. Um, people like to punish each other. Punishment helps improve contributions. There's all sorts of results. What we're interested in here is whether it matters who you're playing with and who those people are playing with. So rather than having people play in a group where everyone is playing with everyone, uh, distribute people on a network, which is sort of more like the real world, and ask, does the way, people are, is the way that people are wired together have any effect uh, on, uh, on the co you know, aggregate cooperation levels? Uh, and so, again, coming back to Michael Kearns from the beginning, uh, we know that certain kinds of, uh, of collective problem solving uh, do actually have very strong dependencies on network structure, so graph coloring, for example, or consensus games or, or economic exchange. And there's all sorts of simulation work that has been done on various kinds of uh, social dilemmas that also suggest that network structure is important. Uh, and so we want to test this uh, experimentally. And again, we're going to use the mechanical Turk sandbox combination. The big difference here, and it's a huge difference in terms of running experiments, is that now we have to have all the people show up at the same time and stick around for the whole game. Right? So it's a synchronous game as opposed to an asynchronous game. Everything we've looked up up to now has been asynchronous. Uh, and so this really uh, causes problems. Uh, and the, the largest groups that we've been able to get to work so far is, is 24, but we hope we can make that larger. So the first thing that we did actually was, was, was really just replicate uh, Ernst Fair's results for groups of four people. And so, okay, so this is paper was published in 2000. We probably did the experiments in like 1998 or 99. These are undergraduate students at the University of Zurich. Uh, uh, they're sitting in a lab. They're being paid in different currency. They're being paid more. 
uh, maybe an order of magnitude more than we're paying ours. There's an enormous number of things that are different between our experiments and their experiments, and yet uh, the results are actually indistinguishable. So this actually is sort of the most surprising result of all, is that you can actually do these experiments online uh, and get uh, essentially the same results. So roughly speaking, people start out by putting in half their endowment, and then they just kind of trend downwards after that point. So this was very encouraging. Uh, the rest of it wasn't so encouraging. Uh, this is, uh, these are the networks that we looked at. So we, th those were groups of, of four people. Now we have four different network topologies, uh, a series of, of, of four cliques of six, uh, a, uh, the same four cliques but with some edges rewired to connect them all in a cycle. Uh, again, the same four cliques, but now with some edges randomly moved around. Uh, and finally, a completely regular random graph. So you can see that the, 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 this, this is L is the number of steps, average number of steps from any node to any other node. The cluster C is the clustering coefficient, the probability that the two of your friends are also, two people you're playing with are playing with each other. Uh, and so you can see that we start out with, well, obviously infinite path lengths going down to just two steps from anyone to anyone else, and the clustering is going down as well. So, um, oh well, the first thing that we looked at actually was just whether playing with more people um, uh, has uh, an effect, and indeed it does. The, the more people you play with, the less you contribute. Uh, surprisingly to us, the network topology does not seem to have uh, much effect on how people play, and this is you know, definitely not what we were expecting to see, and we're still sort of trying to understand this and what uh, uh, Sid is working on right now uh, is uh, whether by intervening in these networks we can actually play uh, you know, a generous player or, or a miserly player uh, and see if we can actually generate different kinds of effects in different networks. Um, so again, these are all sort of very preliminary. Um, in a way, the nice thing about this is that we uh, got all of those results that I showed you on that last slide. Uh, in just three days. So we ran a, a, a bunch of um, uh, uh, 12 experiments with 24 different people in each experiment in just a few days. And once we get this process sort of really down pat, uh, we should be able to run you know, a couple of dozen experiments a week. Uh, so, uh, so in some sense, you know, the main message is, is uh, that we can try all sorts of different variations and really sort of explore the problem space, whereas if you had to sort of get a bunch of people into a lab every time you wanted to tweak a knob, um, be much more difficult to do that. Okay, so just to summarize very quickly, I run through a bunch of experiments. It's, maybe it's a little unclear what they all have to do with each other. Um, but, uh, you know, all of them have some of the nice features that we would like in doing experimental macro sociology. Uh, the small world experiment, certainly macro, very big scale, um, but not even really an experiment and certainly no control. Um, uh, the music lab was, was you know, biggish, tens of thousands of people, but no network, people just sort of arriving in a queue, uh, uh, and some control, which was nice. Uh, for instance, we have the network now, we have a very good data about the network, but we, 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 we're not really doing an experiment, it's just a, a survey. Uh, uh, traffic flow, uh, sort of a good uh, introduction to using Mechanical Turk and a novel recruiting mechanism but no network and really just sort of individual level uh, um, um, behavior. And then finally, you know, this last experiment is sort of getting close to the kind of idea that I've had in my mind for, you know, a decade now about whether we can actually do these sorts of things. But it's still sort of on a small, on the small side and we would like to be able to ramp this up to uh, many more uh, people in a network so that we can really sort of play around with different kinds of structures. Um, so that's more or less what we hope to be able to do, uh, is, is build these virtual labs, you know, either at Yahoo or, or elsewhere. Um, and there are other efforts going on at other places, uh, and, uh, including here, I think. Um, and uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting kind of logistical uh, protocol type issues to be sorted out about how to run these experiments, how to sample properly, how to build up large panels. And, and I hope that this is something that, you know, different institutions can cooperate on and learn from each other. Uh, there's a whole other sort of world of field experiments, and my colleague David Riley has done some, some really great experiments looking at the, 
measuring the efficacy of brand advertising, which is something that no one has ever been able to do uh, in you know, experiments. So now we're talking about millions of people. Um, and uh, you can actually sort of put a number on, on uh, how much return on the investment you get from, from showing brand ads. Um, and ultimately, we'd like to be able to sort of combine all of these things uh, using various kinds of communication technology to extract social networks and looking at behavior online, running things in the lab, in the field. Um, so there's lots of, of very exciting possibilities here. Where is it leading to? Uh, well, you know, just to sort of go back to the first slide, um, uh, it's certainly clear that there are some pain points associated with doing social science that are relieved by uh, using the web, you know, most of which have to do with being able to measure very large numbers of, of people on very sort of uh, micro level um, uh, scales and short time periods. Um, it's unclear like where this is going in terms of the things that you know, social scientists really care about. I mean, these are sort of toy problems and they're interesting in their own right. Um, but uh, if we want to sort of think about systemic risk in the financial system, you can't get too much of that from here. Uh, so I don't want to make, uh, uh, that's why there's a question mark after social science 2.0. I'm not really sure that such a thing exists or that it's appropriate to, uh, you know, how far it's appropriate to speculate. But, I, you know, I do think that when you can measure things that couldn't be measured before, there are all sorts of profound consequences. We've seen this a number of times throughout the history of science. And we could be living through such a period right now. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, uh, for those of you who are sort of starting out your careers, this is, a, this is a very interesting time to be doing it. So thanks very much.